Well, hello, congregation, family and friends, and Bereans. I pray that all was well with you. Thank you for joining me today for the broadcast. I'm going to give you a moment to get your Bibles or whatever you're going to be taking your notes with. And in the meantime, we are going to be looking at a passage in Ephesians 6. I do want to do some review, first of all. Uh, in a recent broadcast, I was talking about recognizing the spiritual war that is raging all around us. I recorded that within the last week. Perhaps you've seen it. Uh, it was really the prelude to what we're going to be talking about here in part one and also in part two, because we're going to be addressing uh, God's armor and are we wearing all the pieces of God's armor. But before we do that, while you're getting ready, what I would like to do as a matter of review is just to go over the seven recognitions that we noticed in Ephesians 10 uh, Ephesians 6 verses 10 down through verse 13 as we were looking at that and I encourage you to go back and watch the video if you did not already see it but just as a matter of a quick review here were the seven recognitions that we noticed here in these verses first of all we have to recognize that we can't fight this spiritual war on our own we need God's help and we need the leading of Jesus and the Holy Spirit Number two, we also recognize that we need to be completely outfitted by God. And that's what we're going to start talking about today, the armor of God. The third thing we recognize is that we need to stand firm in the battle. We saw that Paul twice in that in between verses 10 and 13, he mentioned standing firm. We stand firm when we're in battle against the enemy. We don't cut and run. We don't turn around and retreat. We stand firm. And the fourth thing that we learned was we had to learn who our enemy is. And in those verses, we clearly saw that our enemy is Satan, the devil himself. He does not want God to succeed with his people on any level for any reason. Our true enemy is Satan. The fifth recognition that we saw is that what we are fighting against, and the Bible said we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. We're not fighting against each other. We're fighting against those spiritual elements. The sixth thing that we learn is that we have to recognize that we cannot survive without God's protection. We can't go into battle and think we're going to win war and leave God behind. It's just not going to happen. And the seventh and final recognition that we saw is what the evil day is that talks about in verse uh, 13. What was the evil day? And we recognize that it wasn't a particular day. It's any time that we're under attack and we're being attacked. Today's evil day. Tomorrow could be an evil day. We are living in a time of evil of upheaval, where Satan is having a field day out here in the world, and God's people are being attacked every single day. That is the evil day. So it wasn't a literal one day. So what we want to do now is actually turn to the actual parts of God's armor. There are six of them. We're going to look at three of them today in this broadcast, and then Lord willing, very soon I'll be doing part two, and we can look at the last three parts. Now, let me say this up front. Now you should be ready with your notes or have your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter 6. We are going to be looking at verses 14 and 15 today because it contains the first three pieces. Now, let me just give you a little heads up what I'm going to do and how I'm going to present this, okay? We need to see each piece of God's armor in a threefold way as Paul is presenting it and as I see that here. Number one is the actual physical piece of the armor, of the protection of what a soldier would have had at that time, the physical part. Number two, we have to see what the spiritual connection is and the spiritual meaning behind each one of those pieces. And the third thing is how does it relate to Jesus Christ? because each one does relate to our Lord and Savior. So here's what Paul was describing, okay? Now remember, back then, even when Paul was writing this, the Romans were still in charge. And so as he's writing to the Ephesian church, and as the people were reading this letter, they would have understood and they would have recognized these various physical pieces of armor, because it would have looked very similar to what a Roman soldier or any soldier at that time would have looked like when we talk about the breastplate and the sword and so on, and we'll be getting into that. So Paul is describing for his readers and for us what a soldier looks like, but he's also showing us, I believe, uh, the greater spiritual picture 
and application using the physical pieces as examples, okay? Hopefully I did not confuse you with all that, but just let's let remember as we go through all this, we're looking at the physical piece. What is the spiritual meaning of that piece? And then how does it relate to Jesus Christ? Okay, because every piece will reach uh, Jesus and it will point us directly to the Savior. So having said all that, let's take a breath and let's get started on God's armor. Let's begin in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 6. Here's the first two pieces. Paul says, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, let's go back and see what Paul's saying. He said, stand firm. This is the third time, if you're keeping track, in this passage already. The third time that Paul has said, stand firm. We are to remain steadfast, unmovable. We are to remain where God has placed us. Where has God placed you? What does he have you doing? Are you standing firm, even though the enemy may be attacking you? Even, even though the devil is trying to discourage you? Are you standing firm? I, I'll tell you, a, few, a couple hours ago, before I came on live here, a couple hours ago, I was having quite a time this morning. I was under attack. I was under spiritual attack. Satan likes to disrupt my thought process. He likes to disrupt on those writing days when I'm trying to write a sermon for my congregation, and I start in on, and he likes to just disrupt things. And I have to remember this. I have to stand firm against him. He is the enemy, and he's trying to knock me off of what God has called me to do. He's not going to succeed. So I'm encouraged when I see things like this where Paul says, stand firm, and I see it three times. There's no dissension in God's army. There's no turning and running in God's army. So let's get equipped, okay? Verse 14, he says, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Most translations say the belt of truth. Having girded means encircle, to surround ourselves, our loins. That's an, kind of an old-fashioned phrase, but where are the loins? So let's identify on our body where the loins are. It starts on both sides of the spine. You can't see me, of course, you know, that low on camera. Both sides of the spine, all the way down to our hip bones. In other words, all of our middles are known as our loins. And we are to gird them or encircle them or surround them, he says, with truth or with the belt of truth. What does a belt do? We all know, we all wear them, right? It holds things up. It keeps things in their proper place. A belt goes around the center of our bodies, around our waists, now, a soldier, a belt was very important to the soldier. Why? It's where they would have their scabbard. They hold their sword. They may have had other things around their belt that they needed, other weapons. Money sacks were often kept on the belt level. It was something that was easy. It was handy. It was easy to get to. If a soldier was in battle, they could pull their sword out right there from their waist. If they had another weapon or something else, it was easily reached. There's a reason why Paul is mentioning this one first, because it's center to everything else that's going to be on the soldier's body. A belt wasn't essential. It wasn't an extra. It was essential. And that's the physical part of the belt. So the second part is, what does it mean spiritually? Well, the belt represents truth. It's the belt of truth. It's the gospel truth, which is the center of our faith. It's the truth that we believe in. It's the truth that we share. It's the truth that we base our very souls upon. We read God's word. It is the truth. That is what we share with others. That is what we hold dear to ourselves, the truth. So the Bible, for all true believers, is the truth. And that's what we're going forward with into this spiritual battle. It is truth that we take with us. It's God's truth. And Satan does not like God's truth. He knows it, but he doesn't like it. And he doesn't like when we share it. And he doesn't like when it's preached and when it's taught. And it's one of the reasons he was coming against me this morning. And one of the reasons he did not want this broadcast to go out. So 
who, when we think of the word truth, who said that he was truth in the Bible? Of course, Jesus. He said he was truth. And this is how the belt of truth points to Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Jesus is the truth. And so when we have Jesus as our center, around our center, he's the first thing we focus on. He is our Lord and Savior. He is our general, if you will, in this spiritual battle. And we follow him into this spiritual battle against the forces of evil, against Satan. We carry forth with the belt of truth. So physically, it's around our waist. Spiritually, it represents the gospel truth. And how does it point to Jesus? Because Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And he said that he is truth. So we're representing and we're carrying forth Jesus with us when we engage the world with God's truth versus what the world says is true. Huge difference. So that's, that's the first section. That's the first piece of God's armor. And I wanted to make sure because, my, I wrote so many notes down because this is such a deep passage. I want to make sure I get all of it. Do you remember back here in verse 11? I just noticed this here. Back in verse 11 of Ephesians 6, Paul said, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Well, one of the schemes of the devil is false doctrine, false truth. That's an oxymoron, right? False truth, things that are not true, things that are being said or being taught that are not true. And we, taking forward the belt of truth, we are standing firm against the schemes of the devil, the lies and the deceptions. And that's what's going on. So there's our first piece. Now, the rest of verse 14, of course. So now we have the belt of truth, one down. Here's the next one. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness. When you put something on, you obviously, what? Cover some part of your body, your anatomy. We're putting something on. And this is called a breastplate. Play. Well, this was a vital piece of a soldier's armor, wasn't it? The breastplate very often would cover from the neck all the way down to like the thigh area. And we think of breastplate, we say, what does that mean? Let's give a modern day equivalent. Um, think bulletproof vest. How about that? It's a, it was something to cover all the vital organs as a soldier was going into battle. A soldier, you, you could... Even today, you can lose an arm and still live. You could lose a leg or a foot or an eye. You can still live. But if something happens with these vital organs right in here, your heart, your lungs, your stomach, the vital organs, you have a lot less likelihood that you're going to survive. And the same was for the soldier, of course. Even when we have police officers and whatever wearing bulletproof vests, you protect the vital organs. And that's what a breastplate was for the soldier. That's the physical part of a breastplate. It protected them. And so, um, by the way, the belt that the soldiers would wear would often, and obviously I, you can't see it again, but it would hold the breastplate in place as the breastplate was down here and then the belt would hook into it. So it would all be almost like one piece so this wouldn't shift or move around. It was tightly against the body to protect the soldier. And as I said, you know, a soldier would have a better chance if his main organs, even today, if we're struck or injured somewhere in here, we have a much better chance if we're injured somewhere else in the body except in this area here. So that's the breastplate. That's the physical part of it. But then we have to look at what does it mean spiritually? Well, God tells us right here. It says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. So spiritually... Spiritually, the breastplate represents righteousness, integrity, uh, purity, um, purity, piety, I would say, holiness, living a certain way that very often the world says, no, you don't live that way. You can live anyway. As Christians, we are called to live these types of lives, lives of integrity, lives of honesty, li lives of purity and piety, and standing for what is right as God says what is right, not what the world says is right. We stand firm, remember? We stand firm. 
on those. We wear breastplates of righteousness so that we can withstand Satan's attacks. The same way he was attacking me, the same way he may be attacking you today, because Satan, we know, is relentless. He never stops. He, he attacks us at our core, our core beliefs. See, if he can get you to dismiss Jesus or toss aside the Bible or take one of those core beliefs that we know is absolute biblical truth, if he can get you to doubt that the same way he doubted, got Adam and Eve to doubt God's word, if he can get you to do that, he's hitting you in your core beliefs. It's all of these fiery darts and these arrows that are coming at you. But if you have a breastplate of righteousness, if you are living according to God's standards and God's way, these arrows are hitting your breastplate and bouncing off. They're not penetrating you. They're hitting you and they're bouncing off because we're not going to put up with the lies and the deceptions of the devil. But you must have your breastplate of righteousness on. We must understand what the total vital doctrines of Christianity are. We want to know what the truths are, and we need to cling to them and not give him room. Imagine taking your breastplate off and saying, come on, Satan, come and get me. You've lost your protection. You've lost a breastplate of righteousness. So how does this relate to Jesus? I knew you were going to ask that. Because just as the belt of truth pointed to Jesus, so does the breastplate of righteousness. And I'm going to give you two references here for those who are taking notes. They're both in the book of Isaiah, and they talk about Jesus and these armor pieces that we're examining right now. The first one is in uh, Isaiah 11, verse 5. Isaiah 11 talks about Jesus' future arrival. And in verse 5, we read this, also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. And then later in Isaiah 59, 17, we read this. He, meaning Jesus, put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. We'll be talking more about the helmet of salvation uh, in part two, because that's not part of the first three. We'll get to the helmet of salvation, Lord willing. Here's what Isaiah is saying as he's prophesying about this coming Messiah, which was Jesus. Jesus needed righteousness or faithfulness as he went to battle against Satan, and so do we. So if Jesus needed it, don't you think we need it? We would be sitting ducks, if you will, to be out there fighting a spiritual battle without having all of the spiritual tools that we need. So, so far we have truth, which is the belt, and we have righteousness, which is the breastplate. And that forms the main protection on a soldier, covers all the vital organs all the way down, probably to the upper thigh area. And those two pieces are inseparable. You must have truth and you must have righteousness, and they go together almost like one piece. And we need both of them as Christian soldiers in this spiritual battle. So there you have it. There's the second piece of God's armor, the breastplate of righteousness. But now we have a third for this one, and that's in verse 15 of Ephesians 6. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I, I know we're going to get there in a moment. I know what you're thinking already. We're at war, but you're talking about peace, right? I know that's your question. So, Here's the third piece, having shod your feet or put on your feet. Every soldier back then and even today, all of us, we need proper footwear, don't we? When, especially when going into battle. Shod is a, an old-fashioned word. It just means putting on. Just fit, fit your, on your feet, fit shoes on your feet. Now, here's what I wanted to share with you about the shoes of the soldiers back in their day, okay? The shoes of those soldiers then consisted of two parts. The first part was the sandal, which covered the instep. It covered around the ankle. Uh, but the bottom part of it, okay, had little spikes on it or little nails that were sticking out. So imagine having a sandal and your foot sits in the top and it's latched over. But underneath here, you have little spikes. Or the, I mean, I, I guess you could compare it almost to like a golf shoe that have, you know, when you're, on, when you're out golfing, you have those little spikes underneath. But why would the soldier have that? Why would they have spikes or nails in the bottom of their sandals to do that? 
because very often these soldiers were going out into rough terrain. It would help them stand their ground in battle. But as they're going up and down hills or going through various marshes or whatever, these spikes would help on the various terrains that they would be marching through. Many times if the, if the army was going out, they weren't sure what they were going to be facing. And so they had these nails as protection so that they would not fall over. They would not uh, lose their grip, particularly if they were heading up hills or something like that, carrying all of this armor and other supplies that they might have. So that was the first part of the shoe. The second part was something called greaves. They were, they were brass plates that covered and protected the front of the shin. Very often they were connected into the shoe and they would come up the shin so that the front of the soldier's shin was protected. So between that, if the breastplate came down onto the thighs and then these greaves came up on the shins, it's very likely that most of that would be covered which was really important because you want to cover as most as much of your body as you can when you're going into battle. So they were the two pieces. So even if they were going into rough terrain, let's say, and they were coming through maybe poisonous weeds or poisonous flowers or something like that, or coming up against sharp, sharp spikes, uh, they would be protected with their legs. And that also would protect them if another soldier was slashing at them low, trying to take their legs out, that would also afford protection. So that is the physical part of these shoes. It says, having put on, shod your feet with the preparation. Preparation is re readiness, making ready for something. Uh, having the fitness for is another way of translating it. And as we prepare and are prepared to do everything that God has called us to do, and sometimes that even means suffering for him. All that God wills for us as we are marching forward with the gospel, our shoes are called the gospel of peace. Okay, so there's the question. Now, wait a minute. Um, we're preparing for battle. We're, we're outfitting us as Christian soldiers, right? We have a, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and now we have something called shodding our feet with the preparation or the readiness of the gospel of peace. Well, spiritually, what do these shoes represent? They represent peace, God's peace that is shared throughout the gospel. By the way, did you know, and I'm sure you did, did you know the word gospel means good news? And it does. The gospel is good news for all who hear it. But wait a minute. Doesn't this seem to be like a, uh, a contradiction in terms here? We're, we're, we're at war, right? We're in a spiritual battle. But we're bringing the gospel of peace? How do you reconcile this? That doesn't sound right. We're at war. We're in constant war against Satan and all of his minions and all of those who have rejected the Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and have rejected the Bible. And we are a spiritual war, yet we're bringing a gospel of peace. Thomas, help us make it make sense. The peace that Paul is talking about here is an inner peace. You know, Paul also wrote Philippians. Well, if you look, and we won't turn there, but you write it down. In Philippians 4, verse 7, it talks about that we can have the peace that passes all comprehension or all understanding. It's an inner peace. We know we don't live in a world of peace. Look around us. We live in a world of conflict and sin and decay and rebellion. But we are bringing forth as soldiers of God, as soldiers of Christ, the gospel of peace. Isaiah 26, verse 3, talks about us having perfect peace. There's the third reference in Isaiah. So you have some studying to do, friends, in the book of Isaiah. So spiritually, these shoes, as we are walking forward, going forward into this spiritual battle, we are bringing the gospel of peace. So here's the question. How does this relate to Jesus? Well, just as the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness point to Jesus, so these shoes also point to Jesus. You're going to ask me how, right? Okay. One of my favorite verses, and I've quoted it, and I've done videos on this passage before. John 14, verse 27, Jesus' own words. He said this to his disciples. He's saying it to us today. He said, peace I leave with you, not as the world leaves to you, not as the world gives you, but my peace is what I'm giving you. 
He said, don't let your hearts be troubled and don't let them be fearful. The peace that we receive through Jesus Christ, the peace of knowing that we are truly saved, that our sins are forgiven, that we have the gift of eternal life, that when we die and leave this world, we are going to live and reign with Christ forever. That brings peace. And that is the gospel we want to share with others. You can find peace, the peace that passes all understanding. Isaiah calls it the perfect peace. You can find this peace only in Jesus. And that's why our feet are shod with the preparation so that we are ready, so that when the door opens, so that when we have an opportunity to share the gospel with someone, that we can share the gospel of peace. The gospel of Jesus Christ is one of peace. It's not one of fear. It's not one of anxiety. It's not one of uncertainty. We can know that we have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We know we can have eternal life. We know that our sins are forgiven. That is being at peace. And when people come to true deliverance, when they have turned things over to God, Peter tells us to cast all of our anxiety or all our cares over to him because he cares for us. We take that off of ourselves and we give it over to God. When we have true dependent, uh, repentance, true deliverance, we become saved. We become born again then we have peace that we've never experienced before. Never. Listen to this. Isaiah 52, 7. Here's your fourth reference in Isaiah. Isaiah 52, verse 7. Talking about Jesus. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns, talking about Jesus. That's four references already just in Isaiah alone that reference Jesus. No, you don't see his name there, but they are four references to the coming Messiah. So there we have it, the first three pieces of God's armor. Let's review them very quickly. We, we look today at the belt of truth. We looked at the breastplate of righteousness. And we've looked at having our feet or our feet covered or shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So we're halfway there. Three pieces. Jesus is at the heart of all three of them. So when we go into spiritual battle, friends, we have to be clothed as Jesus would have us to be clothed. I, I pray that this, I guess this is a Bible study, really, this teaching uh, has been a blessing to you. Remember Isaiah 55, 11. There's Isaiah again. He's Isaiah again, like our fifth reference today. Isaiah 55, 11 tells us that God's word does not return void. It reaches all those he intends it to reach. So if it reached you today, it was meant for you today. I also encourage you to be a diligent Berean. Acts 17, 11 tells us that God, uh, God's people, those Bereans, the apostle Paul came to see them. He preached in the synagogue. They didn't just take him at his word. Oh, no, 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 no. Acts 17, 11 tells us that they went and they searched the scriptures daily to make sure that what they were hearing was the absolute truth. They didn't take Paul at his word. As wonderful of a preacher as Paul was, they were skeptical. They proved it by God's word. You need to do the same thing. I gave you a lot of references today. And what you need to do is whether it's me or a church you go to, a podcast, a Christian author you listen to, you watch Christian television, and wherever you hear the word of God preached or taught, listen, you owe it to yourself to be a diligent Berean. Don't just trust me. Don't trust me. We're learning together. All right. But you check out all the references I gave you. You study them on your own and make sure that what you just heard was the truth. Uh, I also encourage you, if you feel led to share this video or anything that I post, this is for God's glory. This is for the edification of the saints. Uh, Proverbs 27 tells us that iron sharpens iron. We sharpen one another as we are on this daily walk with Jesus in this faith called Christianity. We're supposed to be sharpening one another. You learn from me, I learn from you. And so having said that, if you feel led to reach out to me on any of my social media platforms, please feel free to do that. I'm on Facebook and Twitter. I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, I have a Spotify podcast, and of course, I have a YouTube channel. Please make sure you're subscribed to that. Make sure your notifications are on because we're broadcasting more often these days. Uh, praise God for that. 
and I want you to be part of it. Uh, so lastly, thank you for being part of the broadcast today. You could be doing a whole lot of other things, and maybe you have a long list of things to do today like I do, but we took time to spend some time in God's word and start learning about the armor of God. Are you wearing God's armor? Are you three for three so far? Well, come back soon. Lord willing, hopefully tomorrow I will be able to do part two of this and we'll look at the other three pieces of God's armor. I hope to see you soon. And until then, God bless you.